So let's begin our class with some twisting. Lie down on your back, hug in your knees. When you hug the knees, make a note of where your thighs are. You want them 90 degrees from your trunk at least. Leave them high and drop both knees to the right. Bring your arms out like wings, your head turning left. So this is simply a high knee spinal twist. Try to anchor your legs all the way down, even if you have to come up on your hip. I don't mind if the left shoulder leaves the mat, but at least your legs are comfortable. And then as you breathe deeply, you can let that left shoulder drop down. So we're in a study, the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. We're going to read from Yogananda today, a nice reading. A lot of parallels between the Bhagavad Gita and many spiritual books written throughout humanity's history. This chapter entitled, The Infinite Manifestations of the Unmanifest Spirit. So if there's an infinite number of manifestations, where would that put you and me? We're all part of that manifestation. And yoga teaches that divinity is everywhere. Everywhere you look is perfection. It has to be. Everything comes from God. Some religions, though, think they own God. I'm listening to this yoga master in my car mention that very same thing. It can't, it's impossible to wrap a lasso around the creator of the universe. We spin in this little planet, one little corner of the universe that's so vast you can't even begin to imagine its vastness. This yoga master went on to say that human beings are so arrogant to think that they own God. So he was implying that in this vast universe, there are many, many, many other beings. So why do we try and push people when we don't even have ownership of the divinity we're speaking of? The same yoga master said some of the characteristics that we'll read today as this 10th chapter goes into Arjuna asks Krishna tell me a little more about some of your opulences and Krishna said where there's an infinite number I'm going to share some with you now remember Krishna is simply a name of the spiritual realm that you can tap into since yoga teaches that we're all eternal beings we're perfect in every way. We're not broken. This culture teaches us early on that there's something wrong with us. How can divinity be broken? So I'll share that with you in a moment after we transfer to the other side. Let's go ahead and hug the knees in for just about 30 seconds. I hope you were breathing deeply during that high knee spinal twist. So I'm a full-time yoga instructor. This is what I do for a living. 87% of yoga deals with the mental processes, the spiritual. And I decided many years ago I was not going to just teach 13%. If I'm going to do this 60 hours a week, I might as well teach all of yoga. So that's why we spend the first 10 minutes talking about what yoga is. Let's bring the knees to the left. Keep them high. Arms out like wings. Head turning to the right. I didn't mention it, but once the knees get anchored and your head turns right, you could comfortably drag one or both arms overhead, opening up the meridians of the heart and the lungs. So you can get a podcast today on iTunes, free of charge, on any topic for the most part, and listen to it in your car, commercial free. I've been doing that now. I don't know, three or four years. So this yoga master had something very interesting that made me think about. He was describing some of the characteristics of the spiritual realm. God is, in, God is the taste in the water that we drink. God is the smell of the earth. God is the radiance of the moon and the sun. And there are infinite other opulences. As I got to the, listening to the words, I thought to myself, 
And it's possible the cosmic consciousness helped this thought of mine, as we'll talk about today, that you're being helped along your spiritual path. The spiritual realm are, are cheering for you every time you move closer to your true self. But I thought, why can't I worship water if God is the taste of water? Why can't I worship the earth if God is the smell of the earth, right? If everything is divine, what difference does it make what our focus is in our worship? They have not invented a machine that's going to measure whether my devotion is any more greater than anyone else's. But here in this culture, we're pushed on certain paths. Why don't we leave everyone alone? And that's what yoga is. It tries to teach a unity of life, but also it would be boring, right, if we all were on the same path. And one thing God is not is boring. So everyone's on different six billion different paths, and that's a good thing. So I'm going to read a paragraph from Yogananda, as Krishna mentioned, that he is Mount Maru, and we didn't get a chance from Escheron's commentary to describe what Mount Maru is. Among mountain peaks, God manifests himself most majestically as the sacred Mount Maru. Allegorically, Maru is the highest place of divine consciousness in the body, the top part of the cerebrum where God dwells as the soul. The spine with its spiritual centers of divine consciousness is often referred to as Maru Adanda, the staff or rod whose crest is Maru. It's the scepter of the soul's sovereign power over the kingdom of the body. So there you have it, the classic war between flesh and spirit. It's been going on since the beginning of humanity. You have a perfect spirit that's divine, and you have an imperfect ego or intellect. Yoga simply wants you to train your intellect through meditation if you want to move closer to your true self and achieve a greater degree of happiness as we'll talk about in a few moments. Let's release and let's find happy baby this time. Happy baby, bottoms of the feet facing the ceiling. Bend the knees, try to grab the outside of the feet or as far up as what's comfortable for you. For the next 30 seconds, just open the hips a little bit, stretch the groin and reset the spine. Make sure you're breathing nice and deep. So we're going to do 16 minutes of forward folding followed by about 13 minutes of back bending. After that we'll begin a nice winding down. So try to stay involved in the process. Let's move to a seated position and find butterfly. If you want to save some time while you're moving you could draw both blocks up to the front part of your mat I'm going to ask you to do that eventually. Let's bring the bottoms of the feet together for butterfly. Now your feet can start out away from you so you can tip the sit bones forward. Once you get tipped, scoop the feet and pull them in so maybe the heels in line with the forehead or closer and exhale the chin down toward the heels or whatever area the feet happen to be at. Each time you exhale, releasing down a little bit more. So our tenth chapter, the infinite manifestations of the unmanifest spirit by Yogananda. The sloka reads today, understand me to be the chief among priests, Brishhipati. Among generals, I am Shakta. Among expanses of water, I am the ocean. So these are a few characteristics of the infinite number, the spiritual realm, if you will. Rishaspati, preceptor of the astral deities, is the prototype of the priestly order. In his position as chief priest of the gods, he intercedes with the gods on behalf of men and is the protector of men against evil. So since you're divine, you're being helped along your spiritual path. There have been a time or two in your life, I'm sure, where you went left 
when you could have gone right. And had you gone right, surely it would have been a bad day. In the Vedas, that's an ancient text of India, Brishapati is also called Brahman Aspati, Lord of Evolution or Expansion of Creation, through the great power of cosmic delusion. So Brahman's another word for the Creator. This whole manifest planet we're living on currently is called an illusion, a delusion. It's temporary, but it's here nevertheless, and we have to deal with it. In the Golden Ages, wise priests were the spiritual protectors and advisors of the royal sages, such as King Janaka. In this Bhagavad Gita verse, God declares his manifestation in all true gurus, as well as in the chief preceptor, Rishapati. But we're all manifested. We're all divine. So moving through this next paragraph, I'm going to remind you of the fruits of the Spirit from Paul of the Bible. I had to look those up. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and last, from the record I looked up, self-control. Now when you're in the fruits of the Spirit, you're closer to your true self. When you're peaceful, patient, loving, joyful, you're closer to your true self. When you're angry, that's not the true you. Anger lasts only a short time. These qualities we should try to cultivate all the time. So we read to you a moment ago that I am Shakta among, ex among generals. Shakta, the number name, another name for is God of War, son of Shiva, the supreme warrior general among the armies of the gods. Allegorically, Shakta is the word attacker representing self-control. Wow, there you have it. The leading warrior of the discriminative faculties in their fight with the sense-bound mental faculties. So once again, the classic battle, the fruit of the spirit, self-control, battling the sense-bound mental faculties. As you meditate more, you move closer and you begin to develop more of those fruits of the spirit. It is the spiritual quality of self-control that drives ego and its armies of sense desires from the bodily kingdom and establishes therein the reign of king soul. And that's what yoga is. Moving closer to the spiritual realm and not always satisfying the desires of the senses. Same classic war that's been going on. Very prominent in all religions of the world. All right, let's release and find a counter pose for one minute. You can do windshield wipers, arch pose, you can hug the knees, you get one minute. We'll finish our reading after you get the next forward fold. And then we'll put on some lovely music. All right, let's come back up. Half butterfly. Let's go with the right leg bent. Right foot draws near the groin. Now it can come all the way in. It depends on what's comfortable for you. But you know you're gonna be asked to tip down the midline, down the midline, the belly button. So this other leg needs to go wherever it's comfortable for you to get a decent depth. I like to grab the ankle area and kind of bring the right hand. But you have to find that midline 
That's not the midline rolls. The midline's your belly button. That's where you're going to drop. Yes, right there. This is an awkward forward fold, and it's designed to be. You may never find the center. It may get a little frustrating as I start the four-minute timer. But regardless of how you feel about it, try to maintain that descent down the midline. So let's finish up our reading from the Bhagavad Gita today, 10th chapter. Water, because of its fluidity, and remember, among the expanses of water, I am the ocean. Because of its fluidity, which spreads out in all directions, is the symbol of omnipresence of God in creation. Vishnu, the all-pervasive pers preserver of the universe, is depict depicted as Narayana, he who moves in the waters. He rests on the great serpent, Shesha, the creative power, floating on the eternal waters of the creative elements. So you have two aspects. The creative power needs creative elements so that it can manifest this world and anywhere else. These powers are in motion during the cycles of creation and are quiescent in spirit, spirit during periods of dissolution. A similar metaphor is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 in the Bible. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, the waters representing the creative elements, and the Spirit of God representing the creative power. So in many ways, you can find similarities in yoga with other scriptures around the world. The vastness of the ocean and the sky have always captivated the human t attention, stirring forgotten soul memories of the everlasting infinity of God. So Yogananda is suggesting that we have forgotten who we are. And as I mentioned, in this culture early on, they teach us that we're broken, that there's something wrong with us. Had we been taught some of the yoga principles, we might be a whole different culture. When one contemplates the expanse of ocean and sky, he escapes momentarily the confinements of finite matter. So when you look up into the heavens, you go, man, oh man, I must be something else if I'm here. And we are. We're not finite. We're infinite. And we glimpse the infinite. The horizon where the blue sky and the blue brine meet, I call the altar of God, meditating before that most splendid altar of nature, I perceive the enthronement thereon of the majestic divine presence. Okay, Barbara, time is up. Take a full minute to move any way that works for you. But you only get one minute. Right? It's up to you. Just however you want to move. All right, so I may not have to demonstrate, right? I can just be very descriptive with my words. And does anybody know what I'm going to say? 
You're brilliant. I knew you'd get it. Half butterfly on the left leg. Bend the left leg, draw the left foot near the groin. Find the midline, Kathy Miller. Your minute is expired. Your minute is expired. And then drop it on down so I can start the four minute timer. Make sure you stay on the midline, Kathy. You're holding up the whole class. All right, here we go. Make sure you're breathing nice and deep. So yoga is designed to quiet the mind. I had a woman call me this afternoon, or maybe it was late morning. She wanted a more vigorous yoga. I told her, it's not exercise. It's not designed to try and be a replacement for your exercise. And again, as the mind quiets, you're able to find a closer relationship with your true self. The mind gets in the way and then you're stirred with emotions and you're running in that direction when you should be going in the complete 180 degrees the other way. Make sure you're breathing nice and deep. I certainly hope you're breathing deeply.
All right, well done. Go ahead and find a counter pose or poses so you can release any tension that you have in your body. During the practice, if you're in any pain or discomfort, try not to do the pose. That's distracting to the mind and it might make it more difficult for you to find that quietude of mind. We'll find a modification for you. These last 20 seconds, Kathy Miller, you might choose to use a block for your three minutes of lateral bending. We're going to stay seated now for about the next seven more minutes. So if you do use blocks for your lateral bends, you can grab them. If it works for you, your legs straight out in front is the best foundation. Your feet hip width. Look straight ahead and you can bring your hand to your hip as you go lateral or you can bring your elbow to the rug or the block. But begin your lateral move so I can start, pick aside the minute and a half timer. Don't forget to give some affection to the six joints of the neck by dropping maybe the ear to the shoulder, but don't hurt yourself. So Leticia was sharing her story on Thursday out at Church of the Painted Hills. We had about 36 in that class out west near Speedway Silverbell. It was nice class. We've been there for three months and three days. So she comes up to me before class and she said she's a breast cancer survivor but she also has osteopenia. She's taking a lot of prescription meds. She was very concerned about how her bone density test would come. She was just going to be happy if the results would have been not changed but she was very relieved to find out that her numbers went up and that's a good thing I'm assuming because she was very happy about that. I politely asked her to share that with the class and she enthusiastically did just that. So yes, yin yoga is a weight bearing. You're putting stress right now on the 23 joints of the spine, the bones, Let's float the other direction. So even though it's not the classic definition of exercise, it's still good for the bones because you're stressing. That's a good stress. You're holding the pose longer than you typically would in an exercise class. Make sure you're breathing and every time you exhale, try to release. I didn't mention this on the last side, but you could also draw your awareness to your heart and then move it behind the heart to the spine and just see if you can try to bend the spine right at the heart. Just taking it down a little bit with each exhale. That'll help deepen that pose just a little bit. Make sure you're breathing nice and deep. You can come out. Now, how are we possibly going to stretch the spine from the three minute lateral bending? Caterpillar. Feet are still hip width. Tip the sit bones forward. 
but for four minutes you can grab near the calves the ankles or the feet your last forward fold of this yin class total about 16 minutes of forward folding so this class we're doing all the forward folds first and then all the back bends second we're not going back and forth like sometimes we do so we're mixing it up a little bit make sure you're breathing at least twice as deep as you normally do in and out through the nose Find the breath, find the breath. All right, well done. Let's come on out and take a full minute to recover from those 16 minutes of forward folding. Don't you love it? You just love it, don't you? Now, while you're recovering, you can bring, or you can at least locate your block so that when you do come up to table pose, you can bring them near the front part of your mat because you are going to be using them when we get the sphinx but you still have about 25 seconds to rest (laughs) 
Well, we do want to end the class on time. We're going to what? Only three minutes. Let's find table pose. Bring your blocks to the front of your mat, please. It'll make it so much easier to transition, but we're not going to use the blocks for about five minutes. Walk your table toward the back of your mat so your feet are near the back edge. Your hands go with you. They start out under your shoulders. Look down at your hands. Walk your hands two hand lengths forward. And then leave your hands two hand lengths forward on the mat. Sit your butt back toward your heels. You can set your head down to the mat or the block. Try not to rest your butt on your heels. Try not to touch your elbows to the mat. This is melting heart, a wonderful stretch for the shoulder joints. Spread your fingers nice and wide so we can open up the meridians of the heart, lungs, small, large intestines, pericardian, and sangile meridians. This is three minutes. You should feel a stretch in the shoulders. And of course, the upper back. We're trying to stay out of the Dowager's hump category. The Dowager's hump can compromise your respiration, circulation. So if you're leaning forward a lot, even you could be moving into a cardiovascular disease as well. You want to make sure that heart gets plenty of oxygen and has plenty of space, plenty of space to do what it needs to do, which is what? Bring blood to all parts of the body. Each time you exhale, that heart kind of melts to the mat. This helps create a little more space there as well. Let's gracefully make your way to Sphinx all the way on your stomach. Walking forward with your forearms, gracefully make your way down on your stomach. This is five minutes. It's going to go by quickly. Matter of fact, we're on the last ten minutes of our class where we have to stay involved. Then we're going to start winding down. Make sure the elbows start out, Marie, underneath the shoulders and lift your heart up from the mat. Elbows under the shoulders. Okay, level, level the chin and bring in the breath. I'm gonna hold you here for one minute and then we're gonna deepen the pose. Make sure you're breathing at least twice as deep as you normally, normally breathe in and out through the nose. Every time you exhale, maybe you can try to lift the heart just a little bit up and back. You want to always try to make movement with the breath. Just like when you inhale and stretch, you're exhaling. Try to move that heart up and back. I'm going to give you a little while 
just a short time, I should say, to settle in to a knee bend. So bend your knees, move your feet. Bend your knees, move your feet where you feel comfortable. Do not hurt yourself. Kay, can you bend the knees? Can you hear me, Kay? Kay, are you okay? Can you bend your knees? Very good, that's why I'm right over here. Look up to the ceiling, eyes open. Keep the knees bent if you can. I don't want you to be in any pain. This is a full minute. Just breathe. Let that lumbar sacral area, surrendering, right? Let it go, the secret to life. Just let it go. Everybody's looking good. So we're gonna do a little swan. You could call that, borrowing from Hatha Yoga, the legs bent in the cobra would be swan. We're going to sprinkle that in throughout this 10 minutes. So you're going to definitely get some good energy flowing through that staff or rod that we call spine that we read about earlier. <clears throat> All right, you can droop your neck and straighten your legs. Take a moment. Based on your physicality and your feelings that you have now, you can just droop the neck for 45 seconds, or if you want, if your body's telling you, you can drop all the way down, it's fine. But after 45 seconds, we're gonna come back up and finish up this first round of Sphinx. Remember, try to stay involved after this, both rounds of Sphinx, we're going to begin winding down. But back bends, very important in this country. Americans don't do nearly enough. 85% possibly will never do a back bend in their whole life. Let's come back up. However, bring your blocks. Place one block under one forearm, the other under the other. The block has to touch the chest or be very close to it so the elbows stay right under the shoulders. Once you're on the block, level your chin, establish the breath again, and for a full, about 40 seconds, I'm hoping you can get related to the new elevation, which is three inches higher. Keep that breath going. And I'm gonna deepen the pose when we get to the last minute. So you could draw your blocks closer to your chest, closer that way. So that way you don't have to lean your right on top of the weight. Okay, good. Just like last time, I'm gonna let you get familiar with it for a few moments, bend the knees. If you're not in any pain or discomfort, soften the face. Then I'm hoping, let's begin, look up to the ceiling, eyes open, and breathe. If you want, you can even move a little bit, right? Pulling those heels a little closer to the head. Anybody want to comment? Is this a little bit more energetic than usually? Is it, honey? Yes. Good. That's how I intended it. So everyone should have a 20-year-old spine, Doc. If the doctors haven't been in there, everybody should have good fluidity, youthfulness, suppleness. If the doctors haven't been in there, then you can get that from a yoga practice. 15 seconds to go, hang in there. All right, gently droop your head, straighten your legs, gracefully work your way off the blocks, soften the face. It's a strike two on you. Split your elbows apart, stack your hands under your chin, cheek, or forehead. Oh, so that's round one, okay? That pose recommended 20 minutes. We're only doing it for 10 today. We almost always do Sphinx in our yin classes. It's the best way to passively bend the back. 
backward instead of utilizing a lot of energy. Bend your knees again, tick tock your lower legs side to side like windshield wipers. I'll give you about 15 seconds to release a little more tension. And then let's push up and back into child's pose. Let's take a little recess. One minute. When the back bends and your butt sits back to the heels, try to round the back. Let your consciousness tell that back. Stretch out, get back to normal. You got five more minutes of activity. All right, let's move back to Sphinx. However, we're gonna start off at level two. So bring your blocks. Now, if you're in pain or discomfort, then you'll start off without the blocks. But remember, Rose, pull the blocks so maybe they're very close to the chest or touching. So the elbows maintain a good angle under the shoulders so you don't feel like you're doing much work. As I start the five minute timer, remember, this is going to go very quickly and you'll be winding down before you know it. But when we wind down, we still have about 12 more minutes. So there's still a little work to do. If it works for you, level the chin, look straight ahead and the breath will be employed. As it exhales, try to lift the heart a little up and back. Follow that energy, drawing your awareness into that spine. Remember, the spine that you have been given free and clear is a very sophisticated piece of equipment. You have energetic centers of the spine, and I'm currently working on reading a book describing Jacob's ladder. The top rung reaches to heaven, the other rungs, if you will, symbolizing seven steps of enlightenment. I haven't finished the book, but very fascinating how that can be a metaphor for spiritual, lifting your consciousness up to God through meditation. Bend the knees, look up to the ceiling, open the eyes, and bring in the breath. Remember, if at any time you're in any pain or discomfort, then you can find a way to lessen that or let me know, I'll help you with it. We're gonna hold this, Susan, for a full minute. I hope you're breathing deeply. Let's droop your head, rest your neck, Kay. Un straighten your legs, straighten your legs. 45 seconds. And when we come back up in 45 seconds, we're gonna finish up the last two minutes. So try to stay focused. The last minute is going to be in cobra, but we're gonna convert it to swan. So for some of you, you might be a little challenged. We shall see. Let's come back up on the blocks. 
and reestablish, if it works for you, Sphinx for about a minute as I cue you to what we're going to be doing in the last minute, Marie. Now, when we get to the last minute, I'm going to cue you to a familiar pose, Cobra. You're going to push your arms to straight. You might have to, because of the position of the blocks, slide them away from each other so you're able to do that. You also, depending on your arms, you may be able to just drop your hands in front of the blocks and push up. It doesn't matter to me how you get there. But once you get to Cobra, then I want you to bend the knees and try to touch the backs of your heels to the back of the head. Anybody does that, you get 10% off your next class. <laughs> we have had three girls, we have had three teenage girls touch the back of their head with their feet and we lost a dollar eighty of your money. It was very irresponsible of me, I know, when your money. Let's push the cobra. Straighten the arms. Bend the legs. Once you get up, once you get up there, bend the legs and look up to the ceiling. This one's hard, or you have to learn surrender here. You have to learn how to surrender, but don't hurt yourself. As you exhale, just let that lower back go, but don't hurt yourself. Look up, eyes open. Breathing through the nose. And remember, try to touch the heels of the back of your head. Come on, stand up comedian. Thank you. You still have ten seconds. All right, gently drop to your forearms, droop your head, straighten your legs. All right, so we were a little short of time there, but that one is definitely ambitious, right? So we cut the time to about 45 seconds. Don't blame me, it's on my practice guide. It's on the sheet, we have to do it. If you want, you can bend the knees and tick-tock the lower legs side to side like windshield wipers. And then let's push up and back into child's pose. Child's pose, you're on your hands and knees, sit your butt back towards your heels, drop your head down to the mat. No more deep breathing. And eyes can shut. Okay, let's make your way to the second most important pose in all of yoga, the position you would take if it was your final five minutes of rest. We're going to wind down, but we still have about 12 minutes of work. Make sure you test your body as you lie down. Make sure your heels are comfortably on the mat and your head is comfortably on the mat as if you were resting. And just take a moment or two to hug in the knees. So we've already done a lateral bend. Let's see if we can find a delicious banana. So straighten your legs, walk both legs off to the right side of the mat. Keep walking your legs to the right until they can go no further, but the legs are straight, Barbara. Your butt cheeks flat on the mat. Both legs, Andrea, it's not Andrea, is it? 
Alexis, sorry, both legs to the right. When you go no further with the legs, scooch your head, shoulders, and arms to the right as well. How do you scooch? Push the back of your head into the mat, lift the shoulders, and now you have a full lateral bend to the right. Arms start out like wings so your head can turn left. Once your head anchors left, slowly drag the arms overhead until they're comfortably overhead. Don't let one arm hang in the air. Slide your right leg away from the left leg and bring in the breath. This is just going to be two minutes as we have to finish up the class in about 12. And I want to get some twisting in. As you're enjoying this delicious banana, you could explore crossing one ankle over the other and vice versa, depending on your preference. Or you can stay right where you are. But make sure you're breathing nice and deep. Hugging the knees, 30 seconds. So it's great to see Barbara again today. We all missed her, I did. Several asked about her. I was even emotionally hurt a little because I did not want or to quit our yoga. So I'm glad to see Barbara back again. Let's find banana to the left. Remember, do the legs first, then scooch the head, shoulders, and arms as well. Head turning to the right, arms comfortably go overhead. Don't hang an arm in the air. It's comfortably overhead. Slide the left leg away from the right leg, please, and find the breath. If you would like to, you can cross either ankle over the other. It's completely a personal choice. Try to keep both butt cheeks flat on the mat, right, Susan? So you'll have to just, you won't go as far. Now try crossing. Yeah. So if you cross the right over the left, just stretch the IT band from the waist to the knee. Our author, Bernie Clark from Yin Yoga, the best yoga, yin yoga book on the planet today, I think, says that practitioners, there's no favorite way to cross the ankles. It just depends on your preference. But honey, try to keep your butt cheeks flat on the mat. Don't forget to breathe. Don't take a nap, Marie. Keep the breathing going.
right, nicely done. Let's hug in the knees. So we'll move into the last six minutes of our class. And then, of course, we have a guided meditation for you today. We only offer the, the end of yin classes. Today's meditation is the raindrop, the raindrop. But before we do the meditation, let's find a twisted root. So your feet are on the mat, knees are bent. Cross your right leg over the left and try to stack the knees on top of each other. If you want, you can cross the legs twice. If you can't cross the legs twice, don't sweat it. Who wants to be a double crosser anyway? Since the right leg's on top, drop the legs to the left. Arms out like wings. Arms out like wings, head turning right. Once you get the head anchored right, just like before in the reclining twist, arms can comfortably open up so the meridians of the heart, lungs, small, large intestine, pericardium, sangile can be affected. Did I have you, did I say drop right? I said drop, oh, I said drop left, right? Okay, my, okay, you're all right, you're all correct. Yeah, drop the knees left, my mistake. It looks like it's right because I'm facing toward you. you're breathing nice and deep. Let's hug in the knees. All right, that's a 30 second knee hug. Is it comfortable in here? A little bit cold maybe? Nobody's talking to me. Okay, good. Huh? Thank you. We do have an interactive class. Alexis, we have an interactive class. I appreciate. It's quite all right. All right, that's your 30 seconds. Cross your left leg on top of the right. 
drop both legs over to the right. You can double twist if you want. That's why it's called twisted root. Breath is deep. Head turning left. Arms can drag overhead comfortably. Breath is deep. So we're beginning our winding down, the eyes are the receptors of the mind, as often as you can during your yoga practice, try to keep the eyes shut. When the eyes are open, the mind has more work to do, and we're trying to do just the opposite. You may be able to keep the eyes shut for the duration of the class. Well done, that's gonna do it. Let's hug in your knees or move any way that works for you, soften the face. I'm gonna give you a full minute or so to find the second most important pose in all of yoga, your final five minutes of rest. Today though, we're gonna do a meditation called a raindrop. So I'm hoping in about 45 seconds, you begin melting into Mother Earth, eyes are shut, no more deep breathing. You're breathing in and out comfortably through the nose. If you should get lost during this meditation, it's fine. You can find another place to quiet the mind and relax, it's fine with me because you're still achieving yoga. I'm hoping in the next 30 seconds you can melt into Mother Earth and we'll begin our meditation. The meditation is about five minutes. So let's focus for the first minute or so on the feeling of the breath. You're going to feel the areas of your nose as you inhale. Certain areas are affected. Try to feel what those areas are. And as you exhale, different areas of the nose 
you can feel. So just take about a minute and concentrate on those areas. So remember, this rest is the second most important pose in all of yoga. Of course, we know the most important pose in all of yoga is to seek the kingdom within, to meditate and discover your true nature, your spiritual eternity. Let's move away from that focus on the feeling of the breath. And let's start our raindrop meditation. Visualize a single raindrop. Picture it small and perfect, trembling on a leaf. The raindrop is poised in a small hollow where the stem connects. It glistens brightly, more iridescent than the most perfect diamond. Look at it. Move closer to it. Closer still. Look inside the raindrop. What do you see? Look closer. Do you see color? Do you see the sunlight shining through it? Where is the sunlight? Is it glowing all through the raindrop. Move closer. What else do you see? Do you see a reflection of yourself looking back at you? Can you see yourself? Where are you really? Is the real you outside the raindrop looking in, or are you inside the raindrop looking out? Are there really two of you, or only one? Look closely. If you wish, you may move inside the raindrop. It's very easy. Simply picture yourself on the inside looking out. Are you there? Now what do you see? What do you feel? Can you see the leaf that you're resting on or can you only see an ocean of green surrounding you? Can you see the sun or do you only see a brilliance of light? Can you feel the heat of the sun as the light flows through you? Can you feel a trembling as the breeze gently ruffles your bed of greenness? Look outward, look out. Can you see another you looking back at you from inside, from outside? Have you become one with the raindrop? Are you the raindrop? It's time to come back to the outside of the raindrop. Take one last look around as you move outward and bring the feeling of oneness with you. The reflection of you is slowly fading but don't let the experience fade. Keep it with you as you bring your awareness back to your body, back to the room, 
to the miracle of this now moment. Remind yourself, my body is relaxed. My mind is peaceful. I am whole and complete, just as I am at this moment. As you gently make your way off of your leaf and out of your raindrop, see if you can make your way up to a seated position. So I hope you enjoyed that class as much as I enjoyed being with you today. If you'd like, you can draw your hands at the Heart Center. As always, thank you all for coming out for such a pleasant experience, sharing your Yin Yoga with me and with each other. Today's closing from Mahatma Gandhi. There's more to life than increasing its speed. May all your days be shared with love for all. Namaste.